I'm Dan Brissett. I'm the Executive Director of the Environmental Energy Study Institute, and I'm joined by two of my colleagues, Miguel Yanez Barnuevo and Molly Brindamore. Um, they work with me in Washington, um, and uh, one of the things they uh, work on is the um, uh, work around IIJA and IR implementation. Uh, we are also joined by special guest Jerry Lawson with uh, EPA Energy Star. Uh, Jerry, it's great to see you. Um, before you. we dig into the slides, why don't I turn it over to you, Jerry? I think you have a few welcoming remarks you'd like to make. Okay, thank you. I would like to welcome everyone, but primarily to thank EESI, not only for today's important webinar, but for their years of environmental and energy analysis, advocacy, and education. If you haven't already, I recommend subscribing to EEI, EESI's newsletter and spending some time on their valuable website. As Energy Star's lead for small business and the faith community, I've been especially appreciative of EEI's, EESI's articles for uh, energy efficiency for nonprofits, as well as their general initiatives, uh, publications, and these issue briefings, and, and also their social media presence. Finally, I'd like to invite anyone whose organization is not yet an Energy Star partner to, vin to visit uh, energystar.gov to find the sustainability tools and training and technical support that we offer, as well as links to more sustainability resources across EPA. With that, thank you and enjoy. Well, thanks, Jerry. It's, it's hard to say enough good things about all the cool stuff that Energy Star has going on. Um, I think bang for the buck, probably the best federal program. Um, and uh, so thanks for your long service to it. Um, you Think of all of the facilities you've helped make more energy efficient. It's probably a really, really long list. So thanks for joining us today. Uh, we are here today to talk about opportunities for energy efficiency and uh, for nonprofits. Um, just very briefly, uh, EESI is, uh, we're based here in Washington, DC. We were uh, founded in 1984 on a bipartisan basis to provide uh, policy um, policy educational policymaker educational resources. Our emphasis is on Congress, um, and over time, uh, our work has also expanded to help provide direct assistance uh, to utilities in rural areas to um, offer inclusive on-bill financing programs. Um, we uh, take uh, we have a commitment. We've made a commitment to diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice. We take that very seriously. Um, if you would like to learn more about um, our work on DEIJ, we have a statement um, online. Um, that statement is how we uh, sort of internally report on, on our progress. Um, it's by no means um, by no means a, a suggestion that we have it all figured out, um, but we, we do do our best uh, and we recognize that uh, we have a long, long way to go. Um, our mission is to advance science-based solutions for climate change, energy, and environmental challenges. Uh, and our vision is a sustainable, resilient, and equitable world. The reason why we're talking about nonprofits and energy efficiency today uh, is because there's some really exciting things coming down the line um, that will help nonprofits improve the energy efficiency of their facilities, um, and then also more broadly embrace um, clean energy. Um, and thanks to our friends at Energy Star, uh, we've been given an opportunity to, to, to make the presentation today. Um, we'll start, uh, and we will have lots of time for questions. So for those who um, are online uh, in our Zoom meeting, uh, please use the chat, um, and that's how we'll keep track uh, of questions. Um, even if you have a question as we go, uh, we'll do our best to come back to it. Um, this presentation won't take the full hour, not by any means. Uh, so we'll have lots of time uh, for discussion and for, for Q&A. Um, and if you would like to come back and look at any of this, um, we'll make the slides available and then also uh, post the recording uh, probably on our YouTube channel, um, which, uh, which EESI uses to um, collect all of our online briefings and, and things like that. Let's just start uh, with the basics, and that is that energy efficiency is always a good thing. Uh, fans of Energy Star uh, know that already, but it's always good to reiterate it. For nonprofit organizations, uh, energy efficiency is especially good, um, and that's because it saves previously wasted money that can then be reinvested back into the core mission. Um, uh, ESI is a nonprofit. Uh, we know just how hard it is uh, to, to do what we need to do uh, with scarce resources, um, and simply simply put, the idea of wasting energy um, is, uh, is is really important to how we how we should be going about our work as a nonprofit. It also improves the sustainability um, of our of our facilities, of our operations. It makes a positive contribution to our community as nonprofit corporate citizens. We want to do right 
um, by our communities. It sets and in, in a good example, um, we talk a lot about climate change at ESI and energy efficiency is one way that we can also set a great example. Um, it also increases readiness for other improvements like solar, for example. Uh, and lastly, it um, uh, allows us to help do our part uh, to advance climate change solutions. Specifically, we're here today to talk a little bit about something called the Energy Efficiency Materials Pilot Program. Uh, in November 2021, Congress enacted, uh, or Congress passed, and the President signed into law the Inf uh, In Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, aka IIJA. Some of you may also know it as the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law. Uh, buried inside that big bill, uh, which was billions and billions of dollars of new spending, uh, is a pilot program, $50 million uh, provided to the Department of Energy uh, to make competitive grants to install energy efficiency materials in nonprofit buildings. And these grants are capped uh, by statute uh, at $200,000. Um, we are still very much early in the stages of developing and, and the Department of Energy in particular developing um, this pilot program, but it's really, really exciting. Um, it, uh, it had previously been a bill introduced in Congress on a bipartisan basis, and here it is with funding in the infrastructure bill. And so it, it really does uh, present uh, a really awesome opportunity, uh, potentially to improve some nonprofit facilities, but also to focus generally on the benefits of energy efficiency. The statute doesn't have a lot of detail in it, but it does have some things. And so I think at this point in the process of the, or the development process uh, of the pilot program, it's good to take stock of what we know and what we don't know. Um, because as we're talking today, um, there is an opportunity to provide comment um, that can help DOE sort out some of those unknowns. So for example, we know what a nonprofit means. Um, that's uh, a definition um, that refers to um, the Internal Revenue Code of 1986 that we're all familiar with, 501c3. Um, we uh, also know what energy efficiency material means, uh, and that's a product, piece of equipment, or system that results uh, in a reduction of energy or fuel consumption, and it lists a few examples of common energy efficiency measures. And we know roughly what the criteria of these grants will be. Uh, we know that DOE will apply what they call, or what the statute calls, performance-based criteria, um, and that will give priority to applications based on several factors. Um, one of those factors is the financial need uh, of the organization, um, but the other criteria involve energy savings, cost effectiveness, things like that. And again, if you have questions as we go, please feel free to pop them in the chat uh, and uh, we'll be sure to get them. Um, the statute, like I said, it's not a very detailed provision. So there's a lot of unknowns. A lot is left to the experts and the professionals at the Department of Energy to sort out. Um, but they're a good group to do that. Uh, some of the things we don't know are actually pretty important. Uh, so for example, we don't know what the minimum grant will be. We know that there's a statutory cap at $200,000, but we don't know how small the grants will go. Uh, we also don't know exactly um, what the uh, if the criteria that the statute provides will be weighted in any way. Uh, will they all be considered equally? Um, will some be given preference? We just simply don't know that. Uh, and that will obviously have um, a lot um, of influence on the types of projects that ultimately get awarded. We don't know how involved the application process will be. And for uh, nonprofit organizations, that's really, really important. Um, a, a, bur a big burdensome application process um, is obviously much less attractive than one that's more straight line, uh, streamlined and straightforward that doesn't take you know dozens and dozens of hours to complete, but we don't know what that looks like yet. We also don't know how many applications DOE will receive. We know we have uh, $50 million. We know we have five years to spend it. We know what the maximum grant is, but we don't know actually how subscribed or oversubscribed the program will be. Um, that's an, obviously an important important piece of information to know, uh, and it will um, likely affect how DOE plans for the overall implementation of the pilot program, not just in the near term. We don't know when the grants will be awarded. We know uh, that they're currently collecting information, but um, you know we don't know exactly how long it will take. Uh, and we also don't know when the grants will be dispersed. So there, I think it's fair to say some time difference between when uh, an application period opens, when applications are reviewed, and then when, obvious, when, when disbursements are made. And for nonprofits that have to manage cash flows, uh, especially uh, nonprofits like ours, that um, um, you know th those are seasonal. Um, obviously, really, really important um, programmatic details to figure out. Um, the good news uh, is that the Department of Energy is currently taking ideas. Um, there's a comment period open right now, uh, and comments are due two weeks from today, um, Thursday, December 22nd. Um, that's a great opportunity 
um, to share information with the Department of Energy uh, about what the pilot program ought to look like. Um, the RFI, I have a copy of it right here, um, and it goes into a fair amount of detail. It describes where the program came from, how it was authorized. Um, it describes um, sort of the goals of the, the comment period and, and what DOE is uh, trying to accomplish uh, in these weeks. Um, they are looking to solicit feedback on issues related to program development and execution, and they have a series of questions, a number of questions split across five areas, outreach, technical assistance, criteria and metrics, funding, and partnerships and community benefits. Each one of these categories, like I said, is broken up into, into questions. Um, those uh, are pretty uh, broad topics. Uh, and DOE uh, is, uh, I think, very open to um, all of the feedback that they get from organizations, organizations like ours uh, that um, you know, want to weigh in in order to support the implementation program and organizations like yours um, that may have um, ideas and comments and feedback uh, preliminarily, at least, about how the program um, can be, um, that's ultimately developed and implemented as the best version of the pilot program. A couple comments on the on the um, pilot program comments. One is that you don't have to uh, address every question. You don't have to try to answer every question. You don't have to address every issue. Um, but the comment period is a really, really important time for nonprofits that have something to say to speak up uh, and to provide DOE with information. Um, that will help them ultimately implement the program. Um, like I said, they're due uh, two weeks from today, Thursday, December 22nd. DOE is looking to collect them electronically. There's an email address here. Um, and uh, the RFI includes some fairly specific guidance about how to go about submitting uh, uh, comments. And uh, whenever you're responding to a DOE uh, request for information, it's always a really good idea to read the instructions. Um, because you wouldn't want your comments to be excluded um, because they're submitted wrong or uh, because they, um, you know, otherwise uh, aren't um, aren't in compliance with the overall set of guidance that DOE's issued. Uh, the DO, the uh, RFI also includes some important caveats, I think, for everyone to be aware of. Um, the first is that the RFI is not an application. Um, it, it doesn't um, envision um, any funding at all at this point. Um, and also, there's no advantage or disadvantage to making a response or to submitting comments. Um, it, it's purely information gathering at this point. Um, so if you are not able to muster comments, that wouldn't have any negative impact on an application. If you are able to um, submit comments, it wouldn't necessarily mean that you have a leg up when applications are eventually uh, open. We wanted to take a few minutes um, to talk a little bit about um, sort of what can happen in the meantime. So we know that comments are due in December. Um, the, the program will continue to make good progress uh, as 2023 rolls along. Um, but there are things that nonprofits can be doing now uh, to help them be prepared for when applications are open. Um, and of course, uh, energy efficiency is always a good thing. So these are good practices for nonprofits to be doing anyway. Um, we have a couple suggestions that we wanted to pass along, and we have a lot more detail um, on, uh, on these suggestions and some of the articles that we've been publishing over the last several months, and there are links uh, to those articles at the end of these slides. The first of our suggestions is to simply learn how energy is consumed in your facilities, in your buildings. Um, that uh, could involve an inventory uh, where someone walks through the, the building in the facility and, and notes the, the energy consuming equipment uh, or appliances that are, that are operational. And um, the age, the serial numbers, um, the type, um, those are all, um, they, they all sound like very basic things, um, but they're all really important things to know. Um, and that leads directly into our second suggestion, which is to engage in some benchmarking. Um, benchmarking can be um, can be uh, sort of done at different levels. It could be um, uh, you know done sort of on the back of an envelope, so to speak. Um, but since we're talking uh, today uh, with our friends at Energy Star, it's a great opportunity to plug an incredibly robust benchmarking tool um, called Portfolio Manager. Um, that is uh, really um, the, probably the best benchmarking tool out there. Uh, it takes a little time uh, to orient yourself with it, but it's an inc incredibly powerful tool. Um, and the, the benefits of benchmarking uh, done now is that it gives you a very good idea of how your building is performing, how your organization's current level of energy efficiency. And that's really helpful for scoping out what types of projects um, might be cost effective for your organization. So it's a, definitely something to take a look at. Also a good time to start defining success, what kind of projects 
is your organization thinking about? Uh, do you already have energy efficiency goals in place? If not, are there energy efficiency goals you'd like your organization to work toward? And importantly, a lot of the barriers to energy efficiency aren't technical, and a lot of them aren't even financial. A lot of them are organizational. And so this is a good time to also start doing the work to identify who in and out of your organization might need to be involved in decisions concerning energy efficiency and moving ahead with the project. It's never too early to start that process. Um, we also uh, recommend this is a good time to start looking for other funding sources to leverage. Um, many nonprofits uh, uh, are located in, in utility service territories where the utility offers incentive programs. Um, there may be other uh, 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 financial benefits offered by your state or state energy office. Um, based on uh, that inventory that you've already assembled, um, you should be able to identify uh, using online resources like Energy Star uh, uh, opportunities for additional incentives. And that's uh, really important uh, when you're talking about grants and rebates, but also for financing programs that can take a little bit longer to come together in, in many states and um, and utilities offer financing programs that might be applicable or available. This is also a good time to start thinking about your audit options. Um, there are different levels of audits um, and your utility may be a good resource for finding professionals who can help come in uh, and um, uh, help you assess sort of opportunities for cost-effective energy efficiency. Um, and then also uh, there are a lot of great case studies, including some that we've published about nonprofits that have made a commitment to energy efficiency and that had benefited. And reading those um, uh, nonprofits, uh, nonprofits from across the entire sector, um, uh, it could be a good way to, um, to learn what's worked, uh, to get ideas, um, and also, um, you know, potentially also expand your network and make connections. We also wanted to spend a few moments today talking about some other opportunities that are coming uh, down the line. Um, the first that we wanted to mention is uh, a, a provision um, that's soon to be implemented by the Treasury Department um, that was um, enacted as part of the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, this uh, involves direct pay uh, for um, tax incentives that were previously out of reach for tax-exempt organizations. Um, we uh, have a little chart here. Uh, previously, nonprofits were were able to, to benefit from these provisions, but only uh, if there was a private company uh, with a with a tax liability involved. And what these um, what the new direct pay um, allows for is for tax exempt entities to receive a direct benefit from the federal government. Um, that's important, maybe a little less so for energy efficiency, but for what might come next, like for example, solar energy. If you're thinking about uh, installing a solar system on your nonprofit, this is a good thing to be aware of. Uh, especially if you are a clean energy project would would exist in what they call an energy community. And again, we have resources on our website that goes into this more in, in detail. If you are thinking about solar, if you are thinking about taking advantage of this direct pay, also a good time to start thinking about energy efficiency. It's a lot easier to install solar panels on an efficient building than one that's inefficient. Um, and the second thing uh, that we wanted to mention was nonprofits serve a lot of different uh, uh, groups and a lot of different individuals. And the Inflation Reduction Act also includes a lot of individual incentives. These are probably not within reach for nonprofits, um, but they, uh, the people in your networks may be tracking them and, and may start hearing about them. Um, so this is a rundown uh, of some of, the, some of the, the biggest ones that are available to residential uh, or households, uh, residential utility customers or households. The first is the Energy Efficiency Home Credit. Um, this is a, a, a rebate or a tax credit, I should say, uh, for heat pumps and heat um, uh, pump water heaters, as well as building uh, um, building envelope improvements. Um, there are caps, but those caps have been increased um, since the last time this tax credit was authorized. So this is a good thing. Uh, and um, um, the tax credits take effect uh, in the new year. Uh, we're also a couple really exciting rebate programs. The first is the home electrification rebate program. This is one that is income based. Uh, but it's uh, going to help a lot of people uh, transition um, their, um, their, their residential um, heating and cooling equipment uh, over from uh, fossil fuels to electric. Um, and, and that's um, uh, a, a really tremendous opportunity. There's also the Homeowner Managing Energy Savings or Homes Rebate Program. Uh, there's a chart here that shows that built, um, um, broken out a little bit into more detail. Um, but we're talking about billions and billions of dollars. Uh, and this was a, probably a good time to plug uh, state energy offices, uh, which uh, are present 
uh, in your state and uh, will eventually be a very, very important source of information about how these rebate programs are implemented um, because these rebate programs will flow um, through states. Um, and then lastly, um, you, you've probably already heard about the electric vehicle tax credit, um, but that's been expanded. Um, uh, and, and increased. So um, not only can you get a tax credit now for a new electric vehicle, but you can also get a tax credit for a used electric vehicle, uh, which is really exciting. That brings us uh, to just a couple wrap-up slides. The first is uh, just running through some of the educational resources that, that we've produced. Um, DOE also has published uh, a lot of really, really high quality uh, and timely educational resources. So I encourage uh, folks who um, would like to learn a little bit more about those to click those links. Um, and then if you're interested in the um, uh, the incentives that are sort of, uh, you know, like the tax credits and the rebate programs that are not available to nonprofits, but that are available to people in your, in your personal networks, uh, we also have some articles at eesi.org um, that link to those. And of course, like I said, we'll make the recording available and also the slides available for anyone who would like to click through those. That brings us to the end. Um, we'll pause there um, and take any questions via chat. And um, thanks so much for your attention. And hopefully we um, uh, hopefully we helped you understand a little bit more about what this opportunity for nonprofits look like. Dan, you're muted. Thank you, Molly. Uh, we have a question in the chat, and this is about regarding other funding sources. Are there opportunities for nonprofits to partner with a city or county to leverage EECBG allocations? And EECBG stands for Energy Efficiency and Conservation Block Grants. Uh, yes, actually, um, there could be. Um, this is um, the idea of leverage and partnership. Uh, is something that the uh, RFI specifically asks about. Um, it's really important for DOE to hear uh, sort of how um, different partnership opportunities or funding sources could be potentially leveraged by your nonprofit and also which funding sources or partnership opportunities might be out of reach uh, for a typical nonprofit. Um, I think one challenge that nonprofits will have to manage as they're thinking about this is the um, sort of the the order of operations in terms of how these programs are rolled out. Um, there will almost certainly be a delay between when applications are due and when applications are reviewed, when applications are approved, and when and then when funding is dispersed. And so it will be a challenge for, um, for nonprofits to have visibility into all of those things, uh, including uh, when they come from other agencies. We didn't talk much about the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund, but that's something that EPA is also working on. So I think the short answer uh, to your question is yes, uh, there almost certainly will be opportunities. What those opportunities look like are very much TBD uh, and a, a major um, source of or major, major topic of interest on the part of the Department of Energy. Dan, this is Jerry. Uh, will you all uh, provide follow-up webinars like this in the future as more is known, like in the spring? Yeah, we'd be happy to do that. Um, I think timing-wise, uh, it would probably make sense to come back in the January or February timeframe, um, share a little bit more about what we know. Um, and, uh, and also, um, by then, too, we'll have had the experience of going through the RFI process. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Happy to do that um, at, uh, at your convenience oh, and the convenience of your network. Thanks. We have another question in the chat, and this is about does the pilot program or the terminology pilot program imply that another round is expected after five years or even sooner if this program is successful? Um, I think uh, DOE is taking the... Um, taking very seriously the fact that this is a pilot program. Um, I think they are hopeful um, that this program is um, just knock your, socks, knock your socks off successful. Uh, and I, I think they would very much welcome the opportunity 
uh, to continue something along these lines uh, should Congress decide um, to keep it running. Um, I think it's an open question how long the pilot program operates. $50 million is a lot of money, um, but um, there are a lot of nonprofits in the United States with lots of energy efficiency needs. And so how quickly they're able to move through um, those dollars is an open question. Uh, I think Congress will be paying very close attention uh, to how the pilot program goes. And I think DOE uh, is really, really well positioned um, to do a really excellent job with the pilot program. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me at all uh, if uh, we, if DOE learns things from the pilot program experience that could then be used uh, perhaps to either authorize um, or otherwise fund um, sort of a version 2.0 um, that builds on the success. But um, yes, uh, I think it was very clearly intended by its congressional authorizers to be a pilot program. And I think there are um, lots of opportunities for this to, to do really, really well and, and hopefully grow into something that's a little bit more permanent. We'll go ahead and give it a couple more minutes and then um, we'll wrap up with the idea that we'll make everything available um, to folks uh, who are able to join us and folks who are not able to join us. Um, it, the last slide I have here, in case anyone's typing a final question, uh, is contact information for me and Miguel and Molly. So um, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Um, email is probably best, but those are our phone numbers as well. Um, we will uh, continue writing articles, uh, talking, uh, you know, documenting case studies of nonprofits. We'll continue monitoring and tracking closely the implementation. And then in the spring uh, or in the new year, when it's the right time, we'll come back uh, and we'll do another one of these. But uh, as we start to wrap up, uh, uh, like I said before, um, the comment period is a really great opportunity uh, to, to make it known to DOE um, what would make the pilot program especially successful from your perspective. Um, they're eager for comments. Uh, and, uh, and in fact, um, I think um, they, uh, they're willing to be overwhelmed. So um, don't hold back. If you have thoughts that you'd like to share, um, this is a great opportunity to do that. Uh, and we'll start winding down. We're just at the half hour mark. Jerry, love to invite you back to uh, send us all on our way. And thanks to Molly and Mig uh, Miguel for, for helping making today possible. And thanks to those who are able to join us. Thank you very much. It was Excellent. I was uh, also impressed with articulating what you don't know yet, which is what we'll come back for. Yep. So thanks, everyone. All right. Well, we'll wrap up. I hope everyone has uh, a great rest of your Thursday and um, we'll be in touch. And don't forget, December 22nd, that's the deadline for comments. Thanks, everybody.